Today's talk will be the uh, sixth in the year series of 28 Wednesday lectures at this time, noon. Um, and, and today I'm delighted to introduce our speaker who needs uh, a limited introduction in this company, uh, Dr. James Madeira. Uh, Jim and I have known each other for a long time and have worked together uh, on many projects. A an accomplished academic medical center physician, medical scientist and administrator, uh, Jim has served as executive vice president and CEO of the American Medical Association since 2011. Prior to joining the AMA, Dr. Madeira served as the Timmy Professor and Chair of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine at the Emory University School of Medicine. He then assumed the Thompson Distinguished Service Professorship and Deanship here at the University of Chicago Pritzker School of Medicine. During his time as Dean at Chicago, Dr. Madeira served as CEO of the University of Chicago Medical Center and in that role negotiated affiliations with community hospitals, teaching hospital systems, federally qualified health centers on Chicago's South Side, as well as with national research groups. Dr. Madeira helped develop and open the Comer Children's Hospital, the Gordon Center for Integrative Science, and the Knapp Center for Biomedical Discovery. His more than 200 original papers have brought him national and international awards, including a prestigious merit award from the National Institutes of Health and the Davenport Award for Lifetime Achievement in Gastrointestinal Disease from the American Physiological Society. In today's talk, Dr. Madeira will speak on the American Medical Association, the reform of healthcare for patients, medical students, and physicians. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Jim Madeira. Thanks, Mark. And it's, uh, it's wonderful to be on, back on campus for something other than a screening colonoscopy. <laughs> what I thought I would do today, I'm assuming that uh, most of you know as little as I did about the AMA uh, prior to my coming two and a half years ago. And so I thought I'd introduce you a little bit to the organization and then talk about what work we're doing uh, in the three areas that Mark mentioned. We'll organize this as, as to what is the AMA, AMA and the current areas, why did we pick those areas, and then I'll close a little bit with uh, a vis vision of healthcare uh, out to about 2030 or so. Uh, we just moved, as you see in the lower right, uh, lower left rather, to what used to be the IBM Plaza, is now the AMA Plaza, uh, right downtown. We, our offices for advocacy are in DC. And our mission statement uh, is to promote the art and science of medicine and the betterment of public health. The origin was from 1847, so we're over 165 years old. Uh, it was in Philadelphia. Uh, the first meeting uh, was to establish the code of medical ethics. This was the first whoops, code of medical ethics in the country. And as you can see, it's, um, it's updated. Uh, the 2013 version is there. And it was to begin to establish some standards also for preliminary medical education as well as for medical school. And it was a rough, rough period in the 19th century. Uh, if you look at education in the 19th century, uh, you can see that in other countries, Germany, for example, at the top, uh, from the beginning of the 19th century, cell theory, ge uh, germ theory, uh, universities uh, embedded this work within them. Uh, the UK, going back to the 17th century, uh, William Harvey and the like at their great universities. Uh, even France, uh, right after the revolution in about 1801,
during the establishment of the first republic, uh, one of the first pieces of legislation was the Medical Education Act that shifted uh, France uh, into a more university-based kind of medical education. Now, the U.S., in contrast to that, uh, had the proprietary schools that you know about. There were very uh, few standards. You took a four-month class, and you repeated that twice, uh, and you were an MD. And you bought tickets for the lectures, just like you'd buy for a movie theater. Uh, so no certification, licensure, uh, oversight. It was a mess. So the first 50 years of the AMA was really uh, getting rid of, you know, fighting snake oil and quackery, essentially. Uh, and then at the turn of the 20th century, there was the creation of the AMA's Council on Medical Education, which outlined now the minimum and ideal standards for medical education. In 1905, uh, the ratings of all medical schools in the United States were published in JAMA. Uh, and this was a quite a critical paper uh, criticizing uh, the schools. In 1906, the Council of Medical Education visited every school in the United States. And in 07, published again in JAMA, uh, the ratings of those schools. And I can't remember the the wordings used, but they were essentially thirds, where there was a maybe okay, uh, worry about this, what are we thinking? And that was published, and as a result of that, uh, this work from the CME, there was closure of 31 schools. The AMA approached Carnegie to get an arm's length third party that was respected uh, in the area of education. And Carnegie identified Abraham Flexner as the, pro as the project director. Uh, now, interestingly, the president of the Carnegie at that time was the one that thought of Flexner on the basis of Flexner's recently published book, uh, The American University. And interestingly, uh, what one of the major points uh, Flexner made in that book is how the uh, lecture hall uh, outlines of universities for uh, lectures and seminars was so outdated and should be uh, gotten rid of. That was in 1907. So you know the consequences of that then. Uh, the CME took Flexner to all of these sites. Uh, the, the Flexner report was confirming and dramatic. And there was a winnowing to 77 medical schools. Uh, this was a positive thing, but there's also a um, a negative side to this, frankly, and that is all medical education was proprietary. Uh, there were African American proprietary schools as well. And American universities discriminated against African Americans and did not welcome them onto university campuses at that time. So those two things together really led to there being almost no African American physicians uh, in this country early on and we still suffer from that a bit today. Just to give you an idea of what happened in this country in the 20th century then, and Flexner actually also had a role in this. Um, he, one of his subsequent jobs was as the, the director of the Rockefeller Foundation for General Education. And in that job, they helped schools establish endowments. And since he had done this work on medical schools, he did that with medical schools. Now, at that time, before that activity happened, if you took the totality of endowment dollars in divinity schools in the United States, it was 10 times the amount of medical schools. Uh, so there was also a huge emphasis on moving to an endowment secured base for science. And just a couple of benchmarks. The clinical one showed at the bottom is in 1900, 16% of American males died at age one. A century later, the age at which 16% of American males were dead was 61, 60 year difference. In the sciences, if you look at the first quarter of the century, there were zero American noblists in physiology or medicine. In the last quarter of that same century, there were 45 American noblists in physiology or medicine. Now to get, you have to put this into perspective to understand the rapidity of this change. Uh, 
this change occurred in a, you know, we've been, we, we made, branched off apes about five million years ago and been walking around like we are for about 100,000 years. So we take that 100,000 years and normalize it to one year. This happened in the evening of December 31st. And it shows how rapid a restructuring uh, can occur in this area. And there could be another one. The AMA is really the sum of multiple parts, uh, something I certainly didn't understand. Uh, these five parts begin with the House of Delegates. It's the assembly of all 185 medical societies, all 50 states, all specialty societies. Societies that you've heard about, American College of Cardiology, societies that you've never heard about. My favorite is the Society of Underwater Medicine. All physicians in the United States belong to one or more of these societies. And it's this house representing those societies that make the policy of the AMA uh, and elect its presidents each year. And that's, the, what, that's what gives it the voice, I think, so powerfully in Washington. And then there's the members, the physicians that become direct members as well, usually for material reasons. You know, when they want JAMA or a business tool. Uh, about 20% of American physicians, uh, with the advent of specialty societies, that number had decreased over time. Uh, year before last, we had the first increase since 89. We increased again last year, and this year we know we're increasing the third time. Practice tools, uh, variety of tools that we have. Uh, we maintain the National Physician uh, Master File. So for example, after Katrina, it was that master file we relied on to make the connections of physicians to pharmacy to patients again. Uh, we have CPT codes, the billing codes. We also had, before I came, a IT platform for medium-sized offices. Uh, thought we could not scale that, seemed to me. So in the last 12 months, we've developed a partnership with AT&T to scale and a variety of other kinds of practice tools. Research and education. JAMA, and now the JAMA Network with the nine specialty journals. Uh, and our new editor, Howard Bachner, has done a wonderful job. I hope uh, people agree with that when you uh, look at our journals now. And also the quality measures. Uh, half the quality measures in CMS uh, were produced uh, by the uh, AMA. And then lastly, advocacy, uh, both in DC and in the courts. So it's a, it's a complex organization that's both a membership organization, an organization of organizations, a, product, a producer of research and education, and the like. Now our current context is astounding, and one can make this point in several ways. Here, here I make it um, by showing Moore's Law, which is the red line, the increase in transistors on a chip over time. Uh, the green line is the increase in energy of particle accelerators over time. Uh, the black line is the efficiency of the triple product and nuclear fusion reactions over time. These are really fast things. Can you imagine anything faster than that? And I've superimposed two blue lines. One is the increase in the genes found to relate to disease in the last 30 years. And the lower one, with the steepest slope at all, that dwarfs Moore's law, is the rate of decrease in the cost of genome sequencing in the last 10 years. So we have a complex organization, and it's in this really dynamic context. So probably not surprising, when I came, uh, there, was a, there were a lot of ideas and projects going on. Uh, and in fact, uh, when I surveyed the mission area, uh, research and education, largely, uh, and we started there because that's the soul of the organization, uh, there were 110 active projects consuming resources uh, downtown and in DC. And so we went through a rigorous process of being more impactful through focusing. And part of that, of course, is deciding what you're not going to do. And my view in talking to the board was that uh, you're not doing strategic planning unless you decide what you're not going to do. That's the most important part of strategy, if you don't do that, then you're just shuffling things around all the time thinking uh, you're doing something and calling it strategy. So we went through a process uh, where we took these 110 programs and we could package them into about 27 uh, 
uh, financial units uh, or financial programs. And then we developed criteria to assess these uh, on a desirability versus a feasibility plot. And we had pre-agreement before naming these programs with the board of the method that we deployed and what we were proposing, and so no one had to vote on the beauty of their, the relative beauty of their children uh, before uh, actually making a decision. Had a coffee break, came back in the room, I uh, put the programs up and there were a lot of gasps. Uh, but for example, the large orange circle uh, down on the left was our disaster medicine program. Uh, we had a disaster medicine journal, a large program around this. Uh, you know, if you go out on the street and ask five people to name three organizations important in disaster medicine, is anyone going to say the AMA? So we reconfigured dramatically, and from those 110, uh, we went to three. Uh, and this required also an import of new skill sets and the like. And these three areas serve as an infrastructure for some of the components of health reform, I believe. Uh, and the two things that they all share is they shift the organization from an organization that's focused on process to an organization focused on outcomes. And they shift the organization from largely a convening organization to an organization that adds to, as half of its portfolio, doing through partnerships. Now, the organization has always been really focused on the physician-patient relationship. So if that's been the focus, what's derivative from that? Well, what does a patient want? A patient wants a better outcome. What does a physician want? A sustainable environment in which she can practice. And what does society want? A medical education system that produces future physicians that are trained to fit a new type of healthcare that's emerging in this country. So those are the three things. And we have narrow focus areas in each of these three, which I'll introduce briefly. First, improving health outcomes for patients. We're uh, a natural here in that uh, we, as I mentioned, produced uh, many of the quality measures. But those quality measures, as you know, are largely process-based and not outcomes. We also don't incorporate uh, in our system, and there's in fact almost uh, very little in the CMS quality measures, uh, patient reported outcomes. And I more and more feel that those may be the most important outcomes. Uh, patient groups like patients like me are not very impressed with what we call quality measures. Uh, it, it doesn't really resonate with them. It doesn't give them what they're interested in. So we're thinking about then outcomes uh, and outcomes in two areas. Uh, high blood pressure and type 2 diabetes, pre-diabetes specifically. And I just want to point out the assertion here. That the, I would assert that the evolution of our healthcare system has resulted in a deleterious separation of care and health. So we have this separation of public health for medical care. Does anyone disagree with that? Well, simultaneously, something else has happened. And that is, as everyone in this room knows, we've moved from acute disease as the major disease to chronic. So think about that for a minute. Acute disease occurs in the context of someone gets a community-acquired pneumonia, sees their doctor, is in the hospital for three days with an IV drip, and goes out to the community. In chronic disease, most of the pathobiology of the disease is occurring out in the wild, in the community, uh, not in a doctor's office or the hospital. And we currently have this erosion of public health, so how do we think about it? How we've thought about it to date. So for example, if you take Kaiser's work on blood pressure, um, beautiful work, impressive results, but it was all done sort of in the context of the Kaiser Health System. Well, if the major pathobiology is in the community, should we really try to medicalize all of that? Or should we think about more of the public health approach? But if you think about the public health approach when it's eroding, 
you know, what would you do? Well, one thing you could do is try to look for places that have big national footprints in the communities. And also could have business plans and strategies that are sustainable themselves. So you think about more of a private sector approach to backfill this public sector need. So you all know that um, why we would choose these, high blood pressure, number one cause of death and disability worldwide, the uh, emerging epidemic of diabetes. But type 2 diabetes, which affects 26 million, um, is probably not our future problem. Our future problem is the 80 million patients now with prediabetes. And the approach to prediabetes should be largely uh, community-based. It has to do with lifestyle choices, diet, uh, exercise, and we pretty much know that that's not really an effective place. You know, doctor's offices are not an effective place uh, for a health club. Uh, you know, one can give advice, and that advice, we all know what happens to that advice. And there's a lot of evidence now that some programs can be effective in prediabetes. Um, uh, the uh, Diabetes Prevention Program is now uh, the DPP, uh, which is um, uh, promoted by the Centers for Disease Control, uh, shows that in a community setting and pilot studies, that one can decrease the incident of diabetes from prediabetes in adults uh, by something like 60 percent, and in adults over 60 by 71 percent. So these are effective programs that do not really rely on drugs. And here's where we have to make the connection. We have to recognize that we can't medicalize what's on the left. We have to take community approaches to what's on the left. That's where the patients come from. Uh, and the time that we see people in the hospital is short. We also, we also don't sometimes uh, uh, get the right data, and I'll talk more about biometric data in a second. So we now have a CMI, CMMI grant. Um, it's, we have a formalized partnerships with the YMCAs. You may think of the YMCAs as a place to develop your either swimming or your fear of water. Um, <laughs> and exercise, uh, Bill Novelli, who's the CEO uh, of the WISE, uh, has assured me in our meetings that the WISE board has changed their strategy from this community exercise and uh, swimming now to community health and wellness. So here you have something with a big public footprint that has a sustainable business plan that you can link to. And they've already recognized in a couple of pilots they've done that patients will not go on these programs if not told to do so by their physician. So we have to get that hardwired, uh, which is the nature of the CMI uh, award. We now started this within the last month in Wilmington, Indianapolis, and uh, Minnesota. Uh, and the award covers then a rollout uh, to those five states. Uh, and we'd like to find other large footprint uh, community partners as well. Hypertension, the other issue, um, uh, this shows on the right of you know the high blood pressure uh, as you know far and away the number one cause of death and disability, and how from uh, 1990 to 1910 uh, it's become the leading risk factor for poor health uh, worldwide. And yet we have the same problem. Uh, there are 30 million Americans, not a goal for hypertension. And the interesting thing is many of these patients uh, see a doctor, and they still don't have controlled hypertension. Now, some of the reasons for this also relates to this getting too far away from the community. So imagine someone sees their doctor and is on antihypertensive therapy, uh, and the doctor sees that the blood pressure is a little higher than it usually is, and therefore maybe should change the medication. 
and the patient says, well, no, doc, I, you know, I was a little late, so I ran across the parking lot. So what's, and what's the standard for getting a good blood pressure? Well, the standard is to rest the patient uh, in a quiet, relaxing place uh, in a chair upright for 10 minutes. You go to a practice, it's unworkable almost in a practice. Most of the data are generated out in the community, so we're also working with the wireless uh, community in San Diego uh, toward achieving biometric data uh, real time. And then we're taking the same logic uh, here we're partnering with Johns Hopkins, the Armstrong Institute. Uh, we've identified eight to 11 practice sites in both Chicago and Baltimore uh, and are now rolling that out. And we're looking for this community partner uh, to stitch together just as with the prediabetes and then uh, also wire in uh, the biometrics. So, the partners are the CDC, the YMCA, the Armstrong Institute, uh, CMS, uh, and this is all part then of our first part of our strategic plan. I should say this is the first long-term strategic plan in the history of the AMA. Um, like many associations, it didn't have a, uh, a history of uh, doing strategy the way it would be done in, say, a corporate world. Uh, so we're uh, making traction in all these areas now uh, because we've simplified and have focus. So that's the first one. The second is change in, mel in medical education. Now, if you read the IOM white paper, the AAMC white paper, the AMA white paper, Molly Cook's book, uh, everyone agrees that we're doing medical education in an ineffective and wrong way. And they agree specifically about what we're doing incorrectly and yet it's not changing. Now, in the context of a curriculum at a university, everyone thinks that it's changing rapidly. So for example, um, I had uh, a dean tell me that, you know, look, look uh, we're rapidly moving to an outpatient experience. Uh, and we're really, really proud of that. And so when I looked to see what they were doing, it was in two rotations, medicine and pediatrics, and the highest percentage of time in the outpatient in medicine was 25%. And it was non-continuous. It was in and out. For every hospital admission currently today, there are 300 outpatient visits. And now we're seeing more a shift toward home kind of measurements as well. So lots of things uh, to be addressed here. Just a couple of fundamental things. So, you know, as a dean, you always fear uh, you get a, a, a senior political figure or a senior business figure in that they're going to ask you questions that you're not used to being asked in a university setting. So what would such a person be thinking? They would be thinking, how do we know the graduates are competent? Do we know, that we, do we know the way the airline industry knows measured competency in our graduates? And what if I were asked that question? It, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be very positive. So competency-based measurement in education is needed. There are all sorts of outdated, you know, we have 141 medical schools. We have 141 lectures by 141 people on the Krebs cycle. You know, surely one of those must be the best. I know for a fact that there's a bottom decile, from my own experience. <laughs> Flexner suggested in 1908 that this was really, this was a um, really terrible way uh, to have uh, medicine in such a large classroom. And that is now known to be the case in educational theory. And yet, we still do a bulk of what we do often in classrooms like this. Uh, you know, uh, the data, just a piece of data, uh, it's been known for 40 years, for example. If you take an auditorium like this, a talking head like mine, and then afterwards you do testing for retention, you get a bell-shaped curve, not surprisingly. 
And if you tell the person giving the talk what parts of retention were weak, he or she can come back to the auditorium, give the class, the same, uh, another lecture focusing on those, and the bell-shaped curve becomes a little tighter and shifts a little bit to the left. My, my right, your left. Um, there's only one thing that will collapse the bell-shaped curve totally, and that's one-on-one. -on -one. And that's why people are beginning to talk about flipped classrooms and whatnot. That's been known for 40 years. And why don't we use more simulation? Now, people think they're using simul simulation because they have a little bit of it. Uh, we're working with two startups now, both on the West Coast, that are interested in uh, producing adaptive education, clinical materials electronically. Uh, they're competing with each other, and we're agnostic as to who wins. Uh, but you know, you take, for example, the School of Public Health at Johns Hopkins. Their degrees, they give out a degree, as they have in public health for a long time. They also give a degree out now that's completely virtual and online. They don't distinguish between their graduates who gets what. And it's a much more efficacious uh, form of education in the latter. That's why you probably saw Erickson in, I think it was the New York Times last week, or this a couple of days ago, uh, right with a prediction that probably at least half of American universities and colleges will disappear by mid-century. Uh, and then a certain upper echelon, you know, University of Chicago's of the world, uh, may have uh, one, two, five, ten million students. We don't use simulation at all. And it's, it's, I'll give you one other data point. The Department of Defense, as you know, has a big problem with post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, there's not enough psychiatrists to treat this problem that they have. They now have an adaptive psychiatric avatar, the gender of which the patient can select, that produces as effective interaction and outcomes as a psychiatrist. So uh, if we're thinking this is future, too much in the future, I think we're a little wrong. We also have many types of physician needs, and uh, here, uh, uh, you know, the cartoon is for a fair, it's a monkey, an elephant, a penguin, a bird, a goldfish, and the dean is saying for, for a fair selection, everyone has to take the same exam, please climb that tree. And we want physicians of all types, and yet we're largely oriented to the group. We have both a clinical science and basic science need in our medical education. And the reason we've split this is just because basically these faculties are not so missable. Um, you can spend a lot of money and get some subgroup of physician scientists and then take the rest of the faculty and you put a lot of energy in. It's like making a vinaigrette. You shake it really hard and it stays in emulsion for a while, but you know, pour it pretty fast because it's going to separate again. But once you can remove the constraint of place electronically, you no longer have uh, this needed separation. So, you know, for example, uh, these are uh, companies you're well aware of, and then the two uh, I mentioned are iHuman and MedX uh, that are developing toward medical education. And you can mix the faculty types now in an adaptive way. Uh, you don't need faculty uh, in, in one place at a particular time. The other thing is you probably need to kickstart this so you get into an adaptive program that has both clinical and uh, uh, basic science. To get a common understanding uh, can also be done in a MOOC kind of way, and it probably is not all that complicated. If you look at Eric Lander's course on the introduction of biology, he covers the principles of biochemistry in five 45-minute sessions. Now, there's a lot more biochemistry that you need to know, but it can be adapted to the clinical cases. As the platform, you probably need five 45-minute lessons. 
uh, CEO of a large private payer recently uh, ex you know, told me that the, the future impact of site of care is vastly underappreciated. We already talked about biometric data that you get from home. Um, I, I was with the CEO of Verizon, Verizon a couple weeks ago, and he said they've analyzed their company for what verticals they could focus on, and the strongest one is healthcare. Cisco uh, is thinking of this as their next move in this field as well. And it also relates to the fact that, you know, we do wonderful research at our universities to push ahead uh, the forefront of medicine. But if you think about cholesterol, uh, everyone out in the street can tell you the cholesterol story, yet it's widely unmanaged in this country. And there were 12 Nobel Prizes given for the work in cholesterol in the last century. If we cannot apply the lessons from the last century to our current population, what makes us think that new, the new science we're doing will affect our, our populations in the future? And we need to prove to ourselves in an effective way that we can do the effector arm of the science as well. So I've listed uh, in the box on the right some examples of corrector, correctable basic flaws, widespread in undergraduate medical education, competence, individualized, old educational methods, limited use of technology, restrictions imposed by separate groups of content experts, the physical plant as our prison, uh, playing to past sites of care, you know, the, uh, the hospital instead of looking to the home with you know, recognizing we're moving through outpatient now and sooner we'll be home, and playing to pass poor structural decisions, the split between healthcare and public health. You know, if you look at, um, there's no question that we spend too much on health and we don't extract enough value in this country. I think everyone agrees with that. The flip side of that is if you look at data from both the World Bank and the Economic Policy Institute, what you find is that if you stack us up against, OE, uh, against the organization of uh, American European countries and look at our safety network, in every measure we are last. And if you start taking the safety network, public health money and adding it together into one pool, what you see is it's actually more comparable now to other, other nations. And it's also true that in this country, if we want to dip into public health in a serious way for our population, we're almost forced to medicalize it. Uh, if you know anything that's a safety net program, uh, it does best when it's medicalized, which also drives up the cost. So we need to think about these things quite differently. So what will be the, what will be the driver of this in, in the, say, the near long term, 2025 to 2030? Uh, of correcting these flaws. It's going to be largely driven probably by economic imperative. Education and technology 2013 to 2040, going from a uh, fixed place in uh, time uh, to uh, virtual and continuous, uh, where we don't have the restrictions of the prison of the, the four walls, uh, et cetera. It's also true, by the way, that we always think of, what well, you certainly have to have some amount of individual contact, and I think you do, but we, always, we have to challenge all of our assumptions in this area. Uh, Daphne Kohler, who's a professor of uh, uh, computer science at Stanford, one of the co-founders of Coursera, has produced really quite remarkable data of how strong social networks can form virtually and have real, dramatic impact. Rich DeMilo and others, uh, working with people also at Stanford, Rich is at um, Georgia Tech, has looked at the impact of face-to-face -face with your professor and looked at the pieces that are important there. And it turns out the most important piece is the individually tailored feedback 
Another really important piece is the rapidity and the immediacy of that feedback. And what seems to be unimportant is the face-to-face. -face. So again, uh, I think we need to challenge a lot of our older assumptions here. So 2040 in medical school, what do we need? We need a curriculum and a faculty. Much of that can be in the cloud. We need uh, patient sites, of course, and a common one will be in the home. We need a classroom and campus, and that will be the earth. Of course, one needs students as well. Uh, but we may not need the physical structures, uh, certainly not the way they're contoured today. So what are the implications? You know, well, one would, you know, why include the physical structures in the concept of having a medical school? And you could look at this in a couple different ways. In 2040, if there are 30,000 medical students in a class, um, you could say, well, uh, maybe we only have one medical school going to the extreme. Or since you can individually adapt, maybe what you're saying is you have 30,000 medical schools. Uh, each has their own. Experiments such as Coursera, as I mentioned, show valid social interactions need not be physical. You know, the flipped classrooms uh, could affect the science component. And the current research intensive AMCs, uh, now this is a, you know, I love, I've been, to, you know, Harvard, Emory, University of Chicago, I love those places. Um, but if I were to ask um, you, do you think our medical students should be trained in, uh, in the following way. Patient-centered, quality and value, focused, team-based. Does anyone disagree with that? Have I just described the clinical programs at our leading research-intensive medical schools? Does anyone think I have? There's a big disconnect there as well. The last uh, piece is physician satisfaction, practice sustainability. Now, uh, when we brought this up, there would be um, individuals who say, gee, this, this seems really self-serving. Uh, until I pointed out that this is just, you know, this is natural for any workplace. We're worried about patient satisfaction, nursing satisfaction. Uh, we're worried about satisfaction of employees in all workplaces. Uh, there hasn't been much done some, but not much, in the way of physician satisfaction. Uh, and it was interesting, um, you know, I, I had a conversation, a, a conference call conversation uh, with some uh, leaders in this area, and I, I touched on this, and two people said in the phone, said, hey, Jim, no one cares about physician satisfaction. And I said, well, now wait a minute, we've just been, we've just concluded that Patient satisfaction is important. I said yes. Nursing satisfaction is, is yes. In the other workplaces, it's important. Yes. So, so you know, where, where the chain of logic? Uh, am I am I missing something? And I could think of actually no other, no other field, where people fundamentally didn't care, outside maybe the special forces, you know where. And you know, we think, well, you know, those guys volunteered to go in ice water for a couple months, so that's okay. Uh, so we've done research and analysis at six, six sites now. Our partner is Rand Health. It um, is now concluded, went up on the web uh, at both websites uh, two weeks ago, three weeks ago. Uh, we're now doing a dissemination phase, and our partner there is Booz Allen. Uh, that has done for us an analysis of 14 other industries that have spread such changes through them and the methods that were uh, deployed. And then we'll go through an activation phase that will include, um, uh, and in fact, I spoke with Secretary Sebelius about this work maybe six months ago, and she said, I, I want to hear about all three focus areas because they maybe should be criteria in CMMI uh, for grants. So I think there'll be some interest there. I'm not going to go through this in the interest of time. Uh, the overview is, um, ends up being a high road message. And the high road message is the major satisfier of physicians 
is sufficient time to interact face to face with patients and essentially driving home feeling that he or she did the best job for quality care for their patients that day. That's the major satisfier in the studies that come out. And the dissatisfiers are essentially anything that interferes with that. So um, the ability to uh, deliver high quality care, uh, and by the way, also the studies show that physician satisfaction ends up conferring nursing satisfaction, and for reasons that are a little less clear, a little less obvious, physician satisfaction uh, provides a patient population that better adheres to their chronic therapeutic regimens. So we would imagine that it's a link to quality as well, though it's not yet been shown. EHRs have a huge effect on professional satisfaction, positive and negative. Uh, physicians feel that they can see through the EHR the potential for better patient care. If they've converted to electronics, they don't want to go back to paper, at least in these studies. Um, but if I describe their overall pleasure with the EHRs currently as, as um, dismal, it would be an insult to dismal, uh, there are many things that interfere with the patient's um, uh, uh, interaction. So let me just say a couple of things about what we're doing. Uh, we've identified um, through this work, was boots on the ground, uh, 15 uh, tools for physician practices in the administrative clinical area. Uh, we're taking different approaches depending on uh, whether large integrated systems, medium-sized practices, or small. Um, uh, we're also working with advocacy in the vendor community for EHRs. This work was just uh, completed, as I mentioned, a couple weeks ago, so we're just beginning to interact with folks like the Office of the National Coordinator. Um, and frankly, if you look at the EHRs currently, they're optimized for two things. They're optimized for claims billing, and they're optimized for institutional risk mitigation. And they aren't optimized for the rapid, efficient extraction of clinical data that are needed uh, to uh, help patients. So, you know, the view is that that's where the work needs to be done. Uh, claims can be retrofitted then. And lastly, what are we driving towards? So those are the three focus areas. Um, and what are the implications for phys physicians? Well, I think the overall driver is going to be the economic imperative that requires responses now. Um, cost, you know, the delivery of value. Uh, and we're not going to be able to increase that 2.7 trillion anymore in the CPI, long term. The business model is going to change. Uh, we'll shift in a period of years to a total cost view rather than these siloed views, where right now there are disincentives for hospitals, disincentives on both sides. For physicians to keep um, patients out of the hospital, they can uh, actually have a disincentive to do that, and yet it saves the system a lot of money. So thinking about this as total cost will be important. The interoperability, we already talked about the EHRs. The sites, you know, we have rapid shift. The home care is just beginning. Uh, uh, there was a, we, we had, um, just to show you how fragmented medicine is, uh, Rich Humbenstock, who's CEO of the American Hospital Association, uh, worked with us and uh, we had uh, three weeks ago a uh, three and a half day joint meeting of the AHA and AMA in DC. Uh, that was the first time the organizations had met since 1975. Uh, so the fragmentation is all through the system. And this is another, you know, the, where the site is, is, is going to be moving pretty rapidly. Uh, and the mission, healthcare to health and care. So you can see, you can imagine three levels of care, say if you go out 2030, 2040. The first um, is a solution shop, what Clay Christensen would call a solution shop. And that is high technology, complex disease, uh, where diagnosis is made. Newest, it, it can be you know, multi-specialty, inpatient, outpatient. So it's kind of like an academic medical center that currently uh, exists only with improved curricular structure. 
and importantly, a simplification. Christensen would criticize academic medical centers currently as mixing two types of business, the solution shop and what he would call line manufacturing. So that's you know, community acquired pneumonia in a bed for three days getting an IV drip. The AMC's cost basis is really high, so why would you want to put line manufacturing on that cost base? And the reason that's been given historically is, well, we can't train medical students on heart transplants alone. And maybe the conclusion should be, well, yes, that's maybe not where medical students should be doing their more fundamental primary care training uh, if we're worried about cost, as we will be in the system. We are converting disease, not curing disease. We're converting acute disease to chronic. Uh, looks like we'll continue to do that. Uh, we'll have medical home care, but it has to be patient-centered. And when we say medical home and primary care, when cancer gets converted to a chronic state, that medical home primary care is going to be an oncologist, most likely. So we'll think about specialties differently, and those specialties are going to have to have wrapped around them some specialized nursing skills for common problems that these patients have. Continuity of care, because it's chronic, is going to be really important, and that has uh, something to say something about how we train people around team-based work and handoffs. And then I think the most interesting uh, level that's it's most different is health and wellness. Here we're thinking about, you know, you hear these comments about, um, well, why don't we get a new set of providers for primary care that are independent? Well, if we conclude that the system's problem is fragmentation, why, why is it you want to add another fragment instead of making the system coherent and interlinked? And here we'll probably need physicians that may be, you know, working with 80 other professionals, 100 other professionals. Uh, everything from people that are nutritionists to those that predis, predict risk based on genetic analysis uh, for well patients. And these physicians are going to have to have two additional skills that they don't currently uh, have embedded in medical school. And one is high level management skill and also uh, training that makes them sort of part way between how we think currently about a physician and how we think about a public health official. And of course, these will be moving, uh, patients will move back and forth depending on their state, spending a long uh, time in health and wellness, and some a long time in sort of chronic conditions. And one of our overarching questions is a practical one, is how we retain the physician-patient interface. Um, IDEO, the famous design firm uh, we engaged recently and looked at, uh, it was the firm that, from which the Stanford Design School was started. Uh, and they always take a very design-based uh, approach to things. So we expose them uh, to physicians' offices in our healthcare system, hospitals. And when the physician and the patient are interfaced without a computer in between, um, they define that as what seems to be to them the magic moment in medicine. How do we preserve that into the future as well? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the illuminating talk. Uh, the AMA was among the early supporters of the Affordable Care Act, and they've been both praised and criticized for that. In terms of the reform agenda that you've laid out, uh, how do you see the Affordable Care Act affecting your ability uh, to achieve those reforms? Yeah, so I, very, uh, I think the ACA will have a very positive influence. Um, and it will have a positive influence because of access and coverage. Uh, we've been criticized a little bit about this again with the rollout of the website, but you know, you can, you can fix a broken website. What you can't fix is a patient diagnosed with cancer too late to do anything about it because of the absence of access and coverage. Thank you, and I would follow up on that point you just made. Uh, so the Affordable Care Act was originally designed to try to cover a whole lot more people. It's
still will cover more, but now that half the states have decided not to participate in Medicaid expansion, uh, what is the AMA position on that problem? Uh, that the states are making a, a mistake, uh, that, that they that aren't expanding. Also, you know, there have been um, other governmental rollouts of programs in the past that benefited states, and for political reasons, a subset of states didn't participate. Uh, after two to five years in those instances, the states are all in. Um, I mean, it absolutely it makes no economic sense for those states not to expand Medicaid. Thank you very much. I just uh, uh, maybe wanted to ask a little bit off question. You brought up two really good examples of uh, moving medicine into the street and into the culture where we're trying to treat it. Uh, and you brought up um, prediabetes and high blood pressure. So my question really focuses on uh, the stance and the strategy that the AMA has taken to medicalize obesity. Um, you know, that seems like it's a great one to take to the street, but with the medicalization comes, as you had said, a huge increase in cost. So I kind of like some insight into the, the AMA strategy for that. Yeah, so that was um, a policy that was passed by our house that formulates policies, uh, and it's been praised and ridiculed, um, as every one of the policies is. Uh, I think people that work on obesity think that putting a flashlight on it is important. And this classification as a disease doesn't medicalize it. The sequela of being obese medicalizes it. Uh, so we, we know what that sequela is. I gave a talk in, um, to the health ministry of Japan about eight months ago. And as part of that talk, I compared the top five causes of death, a top 10 causes of death in the United States with those in Japan, and we share five. Those five make up 74% of all deaths in the top 10 in Japan, and 86% of all the deaths, I mean, huge swaths of death and disease in our both countries. The other thing that those five share is that in each case, we know how to decrease the death rate between 65 and 95% with simple things we already know about. We just don't do it. Um, heard yesterday that you know, the uh, prevalence of colonoscopy, col screening colonoscopy, uh, had now did not cre increase for the first time in about 20 years. And yet we're only capturing uh, about two-thirds to three-quarters of the population. So we just have to do what we know. Thank you, Godfrey. Hi, Jim. Thank you. Godfrey, hi. Given, given your analysis of the future of, of future perspective of medicine, what do you see are the implications for size of the physician pool in 2025 or 2030. Yeah. So as you know, there have been estimates of um, a need for an increased number of physicians, about 100,000 by 2025, 120,000. Uh, you know, that's our policy. That's the AAMC's view of the world, other view of the world. That's the view the president expresses. I just would say that we also have to be humble enough to recognize that every one of our workforce analysis predictions in the past has been wrong. Uh, and if we end up with a disruptive approach, by definition, it will be wrong. So it depends on how this plays out as well, how quickly it plays out. And the, the extenders, by the way, um, you know, if you really have a health and wellness swath that's functioning well, we really, like those five things that we share with Japan, we can prevent a lot of our disease, too, a lot of our cost. I don't think I need it. Um, fewer people to care for their elders. I'd like your thoughts on how we can build in that medical home model a community where you have intergenerational uh, participants helping to care for the aging population, which would be a disruptive innovation in itself. And you closed with um, the opportunity you had to work with um, the design engineers, the IDEO brothers, and one of them had just 
uh, gone through a tremendous illness, cancer. So I was wondering if you were able to glean out if that had any impact in how they looked at helping the medical community organize in the face of fragmentation and creative destruction. Yeah, that, great questions. I, the first one, I would say that I don't have the solution, but I know where I would look for the solution, and that's the private sector. Um, we need just, for example, with the Y, with some conversations we're having with Walgreens and CVS, we need to have private sector business plans that are sustainable that offload uh, some, of these, some of these elements. So the model you describe, the intergenerational intergener care for the elderly, um, I would think of also private sector. And I have to say, the, um, we've had great interactions with venture, private equity, uh, and industry. And I thought, gee, I, you know, why, why does everyone want to come back and talk with us and spend all this time? And then I realized the reason is that there's a $2.7 trillion industry that's about to undergo, probably undergo, rapid reformation and destruction creatively. Uh, and the opportunity that people are seeing there is really great. So you take ideas like this to that community, and you can always start engaging in good conversations. The other thing I would point out about um, the investment banking uh, community, private equity and venture, is how shocking it is what little knowledge they have of the current health system. Um, really sophisticated business planning, but you can say the simplest things to a firm like AEA in New York, uh, and they think they've been delivered manna from heaven, and you can't believe they didn't know that. Hi, so um, you were talking about how access to care is obviously really important to um, essentially getting your goals accomplished, and I was wondering if you thought that even if all the states accept Medicaid expansion eventually, um, what is the AMA's stance on increasing access to care even further or dealing with the phenomenon of like underinsurance? Uh, so the, the AMA policy is that everyone should be covered. Um, in fact, if you read the policy, you would translate it uh, almost into an individual payer, although that's never been said. Um, uh, this also brings up the, the area of access in, um, as it can be done uh, remotely and within a city uh, by uh, telemedicine. Uh, and there the work is really with the regulators that we're doing, uh, trying to make sure that these things fit part of, say, a Medicare payment package. Uh, these things would obviously take care of themselves in terms of the payment as you shift to a system uh, that ultimately will probably be total capitation and population health. Uh, then it's not so these fragments that are efficacious uh, one can do under that global umbrella. In one of your final slides, you referred to the magic moment, which I, which I understood was the doctor-patient interaction. Um, will, will health reform accelerate th those magic moments or be an obstacle to them? So it was, it, my, my view of that, Mark, is that um, what we were lacking was data. So when we talk about the satisfaction for physicians and patients in the interaction, there, there's, there just weren't really high quality, rigorous social science, boots on the ground data. Uh, to demonstrate that. Uh, and so as we're producing data, I think we get a little more movement, both from regulators uh, as, as well as from payers uh, and, and hospitals. I, you know, the, when I visited the American Hospital Association board soon after I took this job, um, it was clear they wanted uh, me to provide them the combination to the lock where they could unlock the satisfaction for physicians. I said, well, why don't you uh, work toward that end? And they said, we don't have physician voice. I said, I've never really, I've been in places, I've never noticed a lack of physician voice. And they said, no, 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 you don't understand what we're saying. We're saying not a 1,000 voices, 
a unified voice with a message with data underlying it. Please. What are your thoughts on the cost of medical education and other healthcare education? And do you see if um, healthcare education is revised as you sort of proposed here, that that might decrease the cost? And yeah. is there any chance the government would take over this cost as many other countries do for their medical education? Yeah, I, I think medical education is far too costly. Um, that if you shift uh, to programs that are more cost effective, uh, like ones I showed, costs will diminish. I should also say that I, um, you know, I don't have a lot of uh, patience for integrated systems that complain about the cost of their medical students for the following reason either, uh, and that is that, and that's, you know, this is the logic that led us to so um, increase our our um, scholarships here uh, when I was here is that you'll go to a system that's a $2 billion system and it's an integrated $2 billion system. He said, well, now why do you have this complex $2 billion thing connected to a university? And the answer is, well, we have a medical school. Okay, so the only reason you have this is because you have a medical school. So what's your biggest problem? They'll say, cost of education. I'll say, what is the totality of your education in a private school? They say 16 million a year. If you're in a $2 billion enterprise, and that's your biggest problem, 16 million, why don't you take care of it? What's the rest of the $2 billion? Is it clinical care and, and research? Well, the totality of an integrated system. Uh, so, you know, you make those kinds of decisions all the time. Um, so I, I think the cost is unjustified. Uh, currently, it could get a lot less expensive. Um, we're uh, beginning to um, look at a couple of schools that are new to see that, you know, we've formed this consortium of 11 schools. We provided $11 million uh, to 11 schools. And each brings a piece of innovation it could be uh, measured competency, for example, on one hand, um, adaptive uh, learning and virtual patients on the other. And we selected this consortium based on the fact that each innovative piece had already had faculty pre-processing and a champion dean. And you put those all together, I think within a year we'll all be able to start seeing the image of what a medical school of the future could be. Uh, I think I'll ask you to join me in thanking Dr. Madeira. Thank you.